Okay, so in this episode, I want to work on adding in a few helper macros, for things like assert, uh, some cast helper, cast uh, typecasting helpers, uh, a few other main things that are handy to have, either to clean up ambiguities or ugly syntax uh, in the C slash C++ family of languages. There's just a number of issues that I don't like. And so having macros early on so that everything can be written on top of them that clean up a few of those things is going to make the whole code base feel a little nicer. So I'm going to get started right away uh, with working on assert. Okay, so assert, not that hard to get the basics of it up and running. I have this uh, um, sort of two-part setup for assert that I like to use, which lets me sort of separate out the two main parts of the system I want to have separate um, control over, right? I want to be able to toggle or uh, manipulate these two different concepts sort of independently. So uh, this here is the definition for assert, and you can see that the idea is there's this enable assert option that lets me turn that on and off. And I, I adjusted the build script to have a, uh, a define that enables that for now. We'll do a better build script at some point than, than this thing here, but for now we have enable assert right there. Now, uh, the other part of the assert setup is this assert break. And that's set up like that instead of being hard coded right here so that later on we could potentially uh, give an alternate definition for assert break. In fact, what I should probably do is something more like this. So the idea there is now if you want to do something other than just crash when an assert happens, you can just define your own assert break. So this will be handy for things like if we want to turn asserts into a, a thing that print of the line where the assert is happening to the standard out or standard error stream and then exit a process or you know any of the other things you might be able to imagine assert doing. So that's just a nice uh, sort of separation between the usage uh, point and the implementation point so that you can change the implementation and then this toggle still functions separately rather than having to do anything weird where you only define your your replacement for the assert backend if enable assert is done or something right so this side you always implement assert break doesn't ever get compiled out and asserts do get compiled out uh, if enable assert isn't set, and so now both of those concepts sort of work together rather than having to be coupled in a, in a single macro. I also threw in this uh, statement wrapper macro. It's not really necessary if, if you understand how macro expansion works and you pay attention to how you're using things that are macros, and as long as you always know that the thing you're using is actually a macro, it doesn't cause any problems, but I kind of like the idea of just eliminating potential source of confusion when I'm using a macro that could act like a statement, but it doesn't uh, grammatically, you know, the, the rules about when a semicolon gets consumed and uh, when it's required change uh, when you're calling a function versus when you're invoking a macro. Uh, but this lets you turn any statement back into a normal syntax. So whenever I write uh, a statement like an if right here inside of a macro, I like to throw it inside of this statement macro. Okay, so some of these macros are kind of interesting. The uh, the first ones here are just to deal with the fact that macro expansion rules are weird. Having an extra layer that expands strings and you know other tokens, I find it just easier to have these set up right away. Uh, whether or not you use one or the other in any given case is always confusing, so you still have to like fiddle around with these macros when you're building them, but Sooner or later, I find it just uh, makes sense to have these helpers to to uh, make it slightly more readable and to change the way the expansion works to be a little more intuitive in some cases. 
Um, so uh, array count is a pretty typical macro. Uh, don't really think there needs to be a lot of explanation there. The idea is you have a static array type and that you put in here, or a static array variable. You can put it in here and find out how many uh, elements are in that static array. In from putter and putter from int, uh, these are sort of my way of wrapping casting between integer types and pointer types. Uh, the way to do this that um, most compilers like is to use pointer arithmetic, but technically that isn't always going to work. Uh, we could probably do a slightly better job than this, make it a little bit simpler when we have a few other helpers inside the base that we don't have yet, so we might revisit this. It's also the case that every time I've tried to come up with a way to implement these macros, it always ends up turning out that for some weird combination of compilers and warning settings and stuff, you can find one that won't like a particular method, like one context that won't like whatever method you're using. So it ends up being the case that you sort of need to have different implementations for how you do these casts anyway. And so having them behind this not only cuts down on a lot of tedious typing whenever you want to do these casts, it's also helpful because it means you can give each compiler the, the casting idiom that it will accept uh, at whatever, you know, warning and error level you are using. So that just sort of wraps that little problem up behind these macros, which is nice. These right here are pretty interesting. So if you take a null pointer and cast it to a particular struct type, uh, then you can index it to get one of its members. Now you can't read or write from that member, so you, you can't use it that way. But you can use this as a sort of expression that abstractly represents that member. So for instance, you can use this to get the size of a member. And what I'm doing right here is using it to get the offset of a member. And I'm doing that by saying, first, give me that abstract concept of a member. Now that's actually an expression that uh, it sort of is based at zero and evaluates that member. So if I take the address of it, what I actually get is zero plus uh, whatever the offset to that member is, at least on every compiler I've tried this on. I'm not entirely sure that this is compliant to the standard, uh, so you got to watch out for that, but I, I f do find that in practice it works and it's a handy way to get the offset of the member without having to do any meta programming or anything. So that's sort of the the passive uh, macros that help me give, get, get a couple of features in there that are missing from the base language that I use enough that I want them right away in the base. Uh, we still want to do a little bit of just putting in other helpful things, wrappers and stuff around stuff that I don't want to depend on directly, places where I find the syntax to be uh, too ugly or too uh, ambiguous uh, to use the built-in syntaxes. So let's get those macros in real quick. So these min, max, and clamp macros are uh, exactly what you'd expect. They're, uh, you know, not doing anything fancy. They, the, the reason I do these as macros instead of as functions is just so that I don't have to write a bunch of different versions. I'm going to want to be able to apply those to integers and to floating points of various sizes. And uh, while I don't really like using type generics, I do find that a couple of these helpers are just uh, too ubiquitous. They're used on every single type. And so having some way to do it generically is nice. Uh, the, the good news is you can do it uh, with these macros, and that's just as good as doing it with a generic function on something so simple. Um, these two are a little bit more unique to me. Clamp top and clamp bottom are just an alternate way of thinking about what the min and max functions do that maps to the way I think about it some of the time, right? So if I'm thinking about something as taking the smaller of two elements, then min. But if I'm thinking of it as I have a free variable and a limit on how high that variable can get, then I'll use clamp top. And since they're the same thing, it, it, it's not always going to be cut and dry which one is the appropriate one, but it comes down to just the way my brain is thinking about the particular problem at hand whenever I'm writing code and having both names is helpful because it's a little confusing when you're thinking about things in terms of clamp top the the one you use is actually min and the fact that is that that kind of feels backwards to what you're thinking about 
but it is the right one. So having the thing set up here where you can just use the name for the thing you're actually thinking about and it'll do the right stuff, that's just a really helpful uh, thing for moving, moving along the process of getting code right for me. Uh, these static defines here, these are the only ways I'm going to use static, I think. Um, yeah, pretty sure. And uh, the the reason I'm giving them each a separate name like this is mostly because I like to be able to search or uh, parse based on more specific information. So especially for global and function, local is just because I don't want it to show up when I'm looking for all the globals or looking for all the functions. But uh, if I want to find a list of all the globals in a file or the list of all the globals in the program, then I have this handy keyword. If, again, if I want to find all the functions, I have this keyword. And since sometimes I'll use a local variable, I need it to be distinct from both of those. So that one gets one too, right? So that's what that is about. Just makes it a little easier to find the things you're actually interested in finding when you're searching through the code or parsing it. Uh, these last ones are because we're writing in C++ and sometimes we're going to want to uh, actually use like C style linkage to functions. Like if we're writing a DLL, or loading in functions from like the Windows DLLs or something. So we want to be able to mark certain functions as using C style linkage. And I don't really like the syntax. It looks weird. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense with the way that anything else in the language works. And it also introduces these braces that will confuse the auto intenter. So wrapping them up so that they don't actually show up as braces in the main bodies of my files helps a lot. So that's what those are about. And now there's one last thing I want to wrap, which is the memory operations from the standard uh, from the C runtime library. So let's write those, and then uh, we'll want to test a little bit of this. All right, so those all look like they're working to me. Uh, again, not trying to be extremely rigorous about the testing and not keeping these around as living as ongoing like regression tests or anything like that. Uh, since this is stuff that's going to get used all the time, we're going to find bugs in it pretty much any time there are bugs. So this is more just to confirm that I've done the basics uh, at all. So there it is. We kind of have the uh, the helper macros that I want set up. So we can move on to the next part in the next episode. See you then.